This is a slightly different format, more about that in a second. Um, but first I want to welcome um, up here Natalie Amga, Lauren Harvey, and Emily Palesi, um, who are all PhD students in the Second Language Acquisition and Teaching Program here at the University of Arizona. <laughs> nice. Um, they're all PhD students in this program. They all share interests in digital literacies and language teaching, in particular in critical approaches to those, and that's um, why they're here. But what we've asked them to do is actually to go through and do a critical reading of the online presentation, so of those 23 presentations um, that you can still access on the website if you'd like to, um, as a way of orienting ourselves in what they represent um, as a sort of state of the discourse, state of the field image for us. Um, so the three of them are going to walk us through that and their presentation, A Roadmap to Participation, Equity, and Inclusion in L2DL. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, hello. Thank you all for coming. Um, I first want to thank all the presenters who shared their research with us. It was very fascinating to watch all these presentations. Um, because there were 23 we're not going to be able to touch on all of them, but we sort of work together to come up with some of the highlights um, and some of the larger themes that we saw throughout the presentations. Ooh. I got it. Oh, I was, <laughs> I was like, it's magic. Okay. Um, so this is basically where we're going today. Um, we are using the road metaphor, so it's present throughout. We're going to start with Highways, what we've termed highways, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, merging, potholes, and then rerouting. And I'm going to pass it to Natalie. So to get us started, we're going to be talking about some highways to L2DL. So this is where we're headed. And these highways are areas in which second language digital literacy research is making lots of strides right now. So. Um, so one area that we noticed as a common thread across these presentations, if the L2DL virtual presentations, is that we're headed towards a participatory continuum. And the one reason for the integration of second language learning using teaching and research with digital literacies is that we have this participatory continuum that allows us to draw from all of our resources and make choices in how we want to engage and participate. Um, and it's ideal for language learners who have this low risk, low barriers to participation, um, as well as for affirming our identities because we can do this from a low risk behind the screen. As mentioned by Susan Herring, there's less of a risk for um, accentedness maybe. And it also is a space for typically marginalized voices to have more access to participate. And in participating in this continuum, we have more of an authentic audience that we can share with, we being language users, teachers, researchers, speakers. Um, and all of this is part of the participatory culture framework in which we have low barriers to participation. There's a continuum between the expert and the novice. Uh, users and um, anybody can engage and interact here to promote civic engagement. Uh, participatory culture really promotes civic engagement. So these are some of the presentations. As Lauren mentioned, we're going to go through and mention some of the virtual L2DL presentations that touched on these um, categories that we see as common themes. So for the participatory continuum, we saw these presentations by Kastek and Jacobs, Jenkins and Fatzinger, and Bonin, Bonin and colleagues as really demonstrating this participatory continuum afforded in second language digital literacies research. These are no by, by no means the only presentations that did this, but if you wanted, if you didn't get to view these and you're interested in this topic, we thought this would be a good place for you to look. So we're also headed as a highway, we're headed towards intercultural competence in L2DL. Um, having these linguistic repertoires and digital repertoires and cultural repertoires all to draw from increases our repository of places to draw from when we're composing or interacting in online spaces. 
So um, this promotes intercultural competence because we have, we have all of these repositories to draw from. Um, and it's, it aligns with the multiliteracies framework. So one key example of this would be multimodal code meshing, as mentioned by um, Smith and Pacheco in one of the L2DL presentations. And this is where students are, or users, are drawing from all of their linguistic repertoires and all of their digital repertoires. And we have the participatory continuum there as well, as there's a shift in expert novice throughout the process. Um, so that is. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so these were some of the examples of that intercultural competence. We had the one that I mentioned, Smith Pacheco and Koroshiva, as well as Uzam and colleagues here um, in the L2DL virtual presentations. Um, our next section is where we're talking about merging communities and resources, and this is these are the connections that we can make using um, the digital resources we've discussed. And so we're looking at how we can merge communities and different resources. So we're going to start looking at communities. Um, and a lot of the presentations, or several, focused on teletandem or e-tandem um, sort of uh, conversations between language users, language learners. Um, and these allow us to have a new definition of authentic. Um, we used to have authentic texts, well, we still do, but now we have more ways to create authenticity in language learning with face-to-face -face encounters with the target language users. Um, there's expanded interaction and exposure. So some of the presentations talked about the connections made between students who were studying abroad and students who were um, unable to study abroad. And so, back to that participatory continuum, allowing these students to interact and gain some of the knowledge from the students studying abroad allows them um, to have more of an authentic experience than just uh, learning from reading about it in their classroom. Um, and the overall goal for all of these is on that highway to intercultural competence and trying to move um, and create more ways for students to achieve that goal. Um, some of the presentations that looked at this were by Magan and Gaspar. There were others, but these are just two examples for his. So then in addition to merging communities, a lot of the presentations we've seen were focused on merging resources. Um, specifically, digital exchange and exploration, um, which are promoting collaboration and meaning making in different contexts, problem solving across different groups, um, cross-cultural discussions, uh, often around critical topics, and then reframing um, previous resources with new perspectives in new contexts. Um, an example of this was the tribe sourcing um, presentation, which was reframing um, old films with new um, more relevant perspectives. Um, another more specific example of how L2DL demonstrated merging resources was specifically in corpus creation and interaction um, among students, researchers, users. Um, so there is an emphasis on greater access to authentic texts, um, representative texts for different purposes. Um, the presentation on Crow was looking at multimodal and multilingual collections, expanding our understanding um, and representation of those collections. And uh, the presentation on Flex was looking at interfaces that promote more opportunities for students to engage in these uh, corpora with self-guided exploration. In addition to uh, those two examples, there were numerous examples of presentations that were looking at how we can merge our understanding through sharing our resources. Um, and these three presentations um, were centered around those. So we talked about highways. These are areas where 
We are seeing lots of strides in research. Now we're going to talk about <coughs> potholes. These are some areas in which many of the L2DL presentations addressed at the end, uh, questions for re future research or areas where we're struggling right now, things that we need to look at. So some of the potholes that we've hit are representation. How do we represent languages, communities, and individuals in digital and online spaces? and access, what are the issues with access to technology and resources in these communities, as well as synchronous exchanges. So um, many of the presenters, the virtual presenters mentioned that it was difficult for everybody to have reliable internet access in their studies. Um, so this is still, still an issue, as well as access to digital problem solving to the scaffolded ways of um, finding, solving problems online through digital inquiry. So in thinking about access to internet, we're wondering, is this a roadblock to critical digital literacy? Um, and we, the three of us, as well as some of the presenters mentioned that as internet and devices are becoming more ubiquitous, this access argument is losing a little bit of weight and importance in the field. So particularly um, this presentation by Hughes, Santa Cruz, and Cortez Roman mentioned that 70% of Sonorans have reliable access to reliable internet service um, and that more of an issue is actually scaffolding the use of technology when it's being used in classroom spaces. So the access issue is still an issue and something for us to consider as researchers in future research, but less so than some more oppressive access issues like the scaffolding of technology that I mentioned, but also standards-based curriculum that may marginalize certain voices. Okay, so with some of these challenges, um, a lot of the L2DL presentations we're looking at, how are we working together to fill these different holes? Um, some common themes that we saw were expanding representation and expanding access. So the presentations looking at expanding representation, we're looking at how can we reframe and expand our resources to reach greater audiences to get greater input. Um, these were also looking at how can we foster greater collaboration among learners, teachers, resources, and, um, sorry, researchers and the communities that are interacting um, together. And then for expanding access, how can we increase um, technology use? How can we uh, incorporate these resources in the classroom with learners, teachers, um, or in learning contexts? And how can we facilitate more of these synchronous exchanges and uh, facilitate digital problem solving? Okay, and so we've looked at some of the potholes and some that we are trying to fill. Uh, we still have many holes ahead of us. Um, and so <coughs> these are just a few of those potholes that were brought up by the presenters. Um, one of those is thinking about imagination and how that factors into um, language learners and language users' um, experiences in these digital fields. Um, there were a few presentations that focused on that and looked at um, creativity in those classrooms, allowing the students to um, participate more in their understanding of their language learning experiences. Another pothole that we still notice is with multimodal composition, how can we assess it? How can we encode it? Um, how can we better understand it in ways that are um, aligned with some of the research that we have so far in the field? So taking into consideration these highways and potholes, we're going to reroute a little bit and talk about how some of our research addresses, we hope, some of these potholes. So um, this is from some of my research, and I think a way that we can really address participa participation, equity, and inclusion 
in L2DL is through critical digital activism. Um, so this comes from a project done with pre-service and in-service teachers, of which I was a part, um, where I kind of proposed this framework to encourage pre-service and in-service teachers to learn about critical literacy by doing critical literacy so that they could then use it in their classrooms. So in this project, I combined three pre-existing projects and or frameworks, the Four Dimensions of Critical Literacy from Van Suys and colleagues, YPAR, Youth Participatory Action Research, and the concept of restoring, restoring in which um, typically marginalized communities share out online to restory common marginalized uh, perceptions. So uh, when I mentioned earlier with my question about Me Too, this would be an example where women have be been able to restory common mindsets. And this was used as an example with the pre-service and in-service teachers of how we could restory mindsets towards food insecurity, which was chosen as our topic because it was a topic that we all felt passionately about or had personally experienced or were experiencing. So um, kind of as an iterative process, we had collaborative choice in action. We chose our theme together, food insecurity, with the goal of telling our community more about breaking down myths of food insecurity and providing resources to um, solve these issues of food insecurity of our, in our community. So we multimodally compose different portions in collaborative groups about hunger, who needs food, um, in this hashtag food on the shelf project. And we shared it out online, breaking down um, common misconceptions about food insecurity and providing local resources for those that need food and also ways to get involved for those that are able to. So this would be an example of how we can combine, um, we can address access, we can address uh, the participatory continuum by collaborating in these digital activism projects. Okay, so rerouting yet again. Um, uh, Lauren and I are going to share a little bit of research that we've done on uh, critical meme literacy as a tool for learning. Um, so why internet memes? They're pervasive. A lot of people are familiar with them. They're instantly recognizable. Um, and these are modes that <clears throat> learners are already consuming, remixing, um, producing, and reproducing online. Um, so we've taken digital literacy, drilled down more specifically to critical literacy, and um, really explored what does it mean to have critical meme literacy. Okay, um, and so one of the <coughs> things we have done is work to create a framework to um, help users of memes to critically analyze those memes and to critically understand them. Um, so these are the four features of internet memes. They are indexical, they are intertextual, they're replicable, and they're templatable. Um, and so by encouraging students to look at these four areas, there are further areas that we also talk about in the framework. Um, it helps them better understand where these memes are coming from, what they can do with the memes, what the memes are meant to do, and how they can use them themselves to um, share their own ideas and to even uh, get critical themselves, to get political, to get um, into digital activism. So all of it's related in this. Do you wanna? Sure. Okay. okay. Um, so really we view memes as one way to get an entry point into critical discussions around news, politics, culture, ideologies, and embedded in all of that language use, how we're using language to engage in these discussions. Um, since this maybe is unfamiliar with some people, we've picked a little example to demonstrate the potential of using these in learning situations. Um, and the example we picked was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, uh, Really, you could pick any topic, 
uh, any meme that's relevant to the learning context, to the audience, and look at um, how it's shaping discussions on social media, how it's being used in um, digital movements. Do you want to? Yeah, and just real quickly, one thing that um, we also talk about in our framework is that memes are not just those images with words on them. Um, they are ideas, um, movements, ideologies um, that can be taken and replicated by the users. And so uh, there's a lot of viral videos that become memes, and then ideas and even people, such as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, can become memes. So when exploring how these um, images and ideas are remixed and reproduced, um, you can see that in these two examples, uh, this concept of uh, RBG as a symbol of resistance has been used for different purposes. So remixing this idea of resistance with the Women's March um, and mixing elements of those together um, is one form that it's been used in, and another form is uh, more recently um, using her descent collar as a symbol for political um, resistance. Um, and similarly, you could look at how it's also been remixed with pop culture to be maybe more appealing for a wider audience and um, making connections across different social groups. Um, and this has spread on Twitter, social media, a lot of places where learners are active, um, reading others' ideas, sharing their own, their own ideas, um, and participating. Anything else? So um, before we get to the discussion part, we just wanted to thank you for coming and listening to our presentation. Um, oh, click the button. Oh. Hold on. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so now we're going to open it up for discussion with um, the idea of attempting to sort of discuss and share our own ideas on the presentations throughout this conference. Um, and so it's not just you asking us questions, but hopefully this becomes a wider discussion where we can talk about how we can keep the momentum going from this conference to confront some of those potholes that we talked about and other potholes as well.